In this episode, we're going to hear from someone who worked in a state lab testing facility who discovered something he wasn't supposed to. But before we get into the story, if you're a regular listener and haven't subscribed until now, let me be the first one to say, welcome aboard. Also, if you like my narrations, check out my true crime channel. I have some very strange missing person cases coming up based off of David Politis's missing 411 cases. Now let's get into the story. Hi Donovan, this happened about 15 years ago at my first job right out of high school. I had to change some of the names and details of the story for obvious reasons. I got my first full-time job working at a state-run animal laboratory testing facility. I was told that mostly we were testing livestock and wildlife specimens. We were searching for communicable diseases which can wipe out a large animal stock or make humans sick from consumption. As an office assistant, I wasn't actually directly involved in any of the testing as I wasn't trained as a lab tech so I was responsible for filing reports as we still used paper files back then. I answered the phones on the rare occasion it rang and also transported samples throughout the building. It wasn't a bad place to work and my job was pretty easy. Although it was sometimes kind of a boring place to work, the people who worked there were a pretty entertaining group. Even though this was a state facility, it certainly didn't have the feel of a government building. It was an old building with a small sign on the door. We all had to swipe our ID cards to get into the building, but other than that, there weren't any security measures in place. Sometimes the security system would be out of order, and we would just prop the main door open with a brick or something. So like I said, it wasn't very secure. I had worked there for just a little over a year when things started to get kind of weird. We got an email on a Friday informing us that beginning on Monday, there would be some new security measures in place. These included the installation of metal detectors, personal cell phones were not allowed anywhere in the building, and everyone would be issued a new ID badge, which would allow access only to areas of the building necessary for your job. And of course, common areas such as restrooms and break rooms we all had access to. Also, it said that under no circumstances were any doors to be propped open and failure to follow these protocols would result in immediate termination. This all seemed a little extreme for a lab testing dead animals, but I thought maybe it was just a change to all state government buildings to make everything more secure. Badge access would be required to enter and exit the building. It went on to say that in an emergency, such as a fire, the exits would open, which didn't really make sense to me. Why did we need to use our badge to exit the building? Again, looking back, this might have been a red flag that something weird was going on. But at the time, I just thought it would be annoying, but otherwise not that big of a deal. It was a week or two after the new security measures that I had a strange encounter with a co-worker. At the time, it didn't really seem all that alarming, but later on I would learn how alarming it really was. I came out of the bathroom door and almost got run over by Josh, one of the lab techs who worked in Lab 4. Lab 4 was the only part of the building that I had never seen, even before the new security was in place. I never had any specimens to be delivered to Lab 4, and I hardly ever saw any of the lab techs from that room throughout the day. I only knew Josh because we always seemed to arrive at work at the same time and park close to each other on most days so we would end up walking into the building together. Josh wasn't much of a talker, so when I say I knew him, really, I just knew who he was. That day, Josh was sprinting down the hall when he almost leveled me. I said something like, Wow, who's chasing you? And he replied with something like, You don't want to know. I always thought Josh was a little odd anyway, so I thought he was just trying to be dramatic or something. Josh never came back to work after that day. I asked around if anyone knew what had happened to him or where he went. No one seemed to know. It was really strange for someone just to quit or be fired and no one to ever talk about it. I didn't know how to contact Josh and we weren't really friends so I just assumed something set him off or he either quit or got fired and that's why I saw him running out of the building. 
I never saw someone run that fast, though, just to leave a job. It seemed more like he was running for his life or something, which now I assume he was, or at least thought he was. It wasn't until my own mistake at the lab that I realized why Josh was running away. I was pushing a cart with some specimens from the refrigerated intake room to lab three. I was so tired after not sleeping well the night before, and I felt like I was walking in a daze. I walked up to lab three, which I had done probably a hundred times when I realized that the door to lab four was open just a crack. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided I needed to know what was in lab four. I pushed on the door as slowly as I could, because I knew I was breaking protocol to look inside. I expected to see a typical lab with tables and machines like in the other three labs. This was nothing like the other labs. There were cages, giant cages reaching to the ceiling. They seemed to be electrified or glowing, I don't know. And inside the cages were some kind of living creatures. We didn't test live animals in this building, just samples from animals. I don't even know if these were animals. I don't know for sure how many there were, probably eight or ten of them. When I say they were terrifying, that doesn't begin to describe them. They were black, but not solid black color. It was more like a moving pattern on their skin, if it was skin. They were so tall, probably at least eight or nine feet tall. Maybe taller because they were all kind of bent or folded over themselves. They had projections like arms or legs, which were moving around and seemed to almost disappear at times before coming back into view. They were sort of squid or octopus-like, but seemed to have an almost human-like quality I can't describe. There was also this very loud humming, high-pitched sound, which I think was coming from these creatures, but maybe not. I was still trying to take it all in when one of the closest to the door turned its head towards me. I immediately felt the most painful throbbing in my head. It wasn't a headache or even a migraine, and I was unfortunately very familiar with migraine pain. It was like a searing pain I can't even describe. I thought for sure my brain was coming out or being pulled out of my head and I was dying. In fact, for a moment I hoped I was dying so the pain would stop. The face of that creature, if you could call it a face, was pure evil. The eyes were only these narrow black slits. It opened what I assumed was its mouth, and something started to come out as if it were turning inside out. I couldn't breathe and I fell to the floor. A man who I had never seen before came running toward me and pushed me out of the way and slammed the door shut. An alarm sounded and a security guard immediately grabbed me and escorted me quite forcibly straight to my supervisor's office. My supervisor, who I will call Denise, didn't look at me. She just said, you were obviously terminated immediately. You may think you saw something out there, and you may feel tempted to talk about it. I would not do that if I were you. I mean, not that there was anything out there. You are clearly not feeling well, and seem very feverish and have been hallucinating. I will not mention your insubordination to future employers as long as I have no reason to do so. Now I will take your name badge and the guard will escort you to your car. I don't know how I drove home that day. When I got home, my mom asked me what was wrong. I didn't have the strength for a conversation about it, so I didn't tell her I was fired. I told her I wasn't feeling well and went straight to bed. I slept for well over 24 hours. My mom said she checked on me several times to make sure I was still breathing. When I finally woke up, I was so disoriented. At first, I thought it was all a dream. I couldn't wrap my head around what had happened. Since I didn't get to see any of my friends on the way out of work that day, I wanted to know what was going on. I called my two friends from work that day, and several times over the next week. They never answered my calls, and I eventually got voicemails from them separately. Their messages were so similar, and it sounded almost like they were reading instead of just talking. Basically, they both said that they hoped I was feeling better, but it was probably for the best that we not hang out anymore, since we didn't work together anymore, and they each asked me never to contact them again. It was so strange. We were friends, like not just at work. 
I was fired and lost two of my best friends, and I didn't know why. One night, several years after the incident, I couldn't sleep, which wasn't unusual for me after that day at the lab. I couldn't get Josh out of my mind. It took me a while to remember his last name. I thought maybe he was on Facebook or I could find an address for him if he still lived in the state. I finally found an address and realized he lived only 10 miles from me. I decided I would go see him that weekend. I just really wanted to talk to someone who might be able to give me some insight into what I had seen that day. Saturday morning, I started driving to his house. I almost turned around several times because I knew it was weird for me to show up at his house years later and we weren't even really friends when we worked together. But mostly, I think I didn't know if I wanted to know the truth about what was in that room. I finally decided that the worst thing that could happen would be Josh would slam the door in my face. When I got to his house, I rung the bell and waited. Finally, a woman opened the door. She looked like she was about Josh's age. Was Josh married? I introduced myself and I told her I was looking for a guy I used to work with named Josh and thought this was his address. She looked surprised then looked down and she introduced herself as Amy, Josh's wife. She said, I'm sorry, Josh passed away almost a year ago. She told me to come inside that she'd love to talk about Josh and had never even met any of his work friends. I didn't tell her that we weren't exactly friends. I felt like Amy really wanted to talk and I did want to find out about what happened to Josh. So I followed her inside. As soon as we sat down, she started asking me questions about Josh. I realized that she had a lot of unanswered questions which I guess she thought I could answer. She said she didn't know why Josh had quit his job at the lab so suddenly. She said it was unlike him to do anything spontaneous. I asked her what he had said, and she told me that was what she didn't understand. Josh talked so much about everything else, but he would never talk about why he quit his job. She said he seemed to be more distant after he quit his job, and she was worried about him. Before that day, apparently, Josh was social and always the life of the party, or at least that's how Amy described him. I realized then that I really didn't know anything about Josh. She thought something bad must have happened at work, but he never told her a thing. She told me that Josh suddenly became interested in alien life forms. Did I know anything about Josh's interest in that? Of course not, as I didn't really even know Josh, but I told her that that was something that we talked about. She said he became almost obsessed. He joined online groups and was always chatting with others about alien encounters and abductions. He was even starting to write a book about aliens. She said it was so unlike him to be so interested in science fiction as he always made fun of people who believed in anything supernatural and that it seemed like he wasn't just interested but was also starting to believe it. She said she tried to be supportive in his new writing career, but it was hard because he was just becoming so different from the man she had married. I was feeling uncomfortable with how much she was sharing, since she obviously thought Josh and I were closer than we were. She went on to tell me that Josh was diagnosed with cancer within months of quitting his job at the lab. She said the doctors couldn't even really identify what kind of cancer it was. He had been to several top cancer centers, and no one, even the experts, could make a definitive diagnosis. She said his cancer initially responded to chemotherapy, and he was considered to be in remission for a little over a year when the cancer returned. This time, it had already ravaged his entire body, and he lived only a few weeks after it came back. This was a lot to take in. Then she asked me if I wanted to read the book he had started writing. I said sure, so she went to the bedroom to go get it. I realized then that my heart was racing and I thought I was about to have a panic attack. When she handed me the unfinished book, I did have that panic attack. Before I even read any words, I saw a picture what he had drawn. She could see my panic and said, I know it's unnerving, isn't it? It wasn't unnerving. It was terrifying and exactly what I had seen in those cages in the lab. I began reading the pages which he described in detail the creatures, which were not of this world. He then described how a man was taken in by the alien. 
not exactly abducted, but enveloped within the creature itself. It then spit him out, so to speak, but the man continued to suffer with pain and hallucinations. I had to stop reading. I had to get out of there. I told her I wasn't feeling well. I apologized and thanked her as I rushed out the door. I didn't and still don't want to know anymore. In fact, I wish I had never gone there. I realized I didn't need more information. I wish I had never opened that lab door. I realized there was no answer that would make me feel better. No truth that would stop the nightmare. So that's where I left it. I have found that as much as I try to forget it, telling my story and Josh's story does help me in some strange way. I don't know anymore about what is going on in that lab, and I was glad when my mom told me the lab was shut down and that old building was demolished. It was replaced by a luxury condo complex. I went to school for accounting. I moved out of state and I've been working in a very stable and unexciting accounting firm for the past eight years. I still have nightmares, but they are becoming less frequent. Thanks for listening and helping me to share my story. Let me know what you think about this story in the comments below. Do you think the government would use a state testing facility to house aliens? It's certainly unsuspecting. It also explains all of the security that was installed and why the building was demolished. I don't know. Let me know what you think and don't forget to check out my true crime channel. Thanks and take care.